Now hear this. Now hear this. Welcome back to episode two of Now Hear This. My name is Fred Clank. I'm the marketing director for the ship, and I'm also a member of the World War II Living History Group. Within that group, I'm the quartermaster, and the quartermasters were the enlisted personnel who were responsible for the navigation and the operation of the helm of the ship. So it's appropriate that today we're going to talk about the compasses on the ship, the magnetic compass and the gyro compass, and how those were used to navigate the ship in World War II. That's going to involve us going up to the bridge up here, and also going down to the gyro compass room, which is one deck below the bridge on the aft end of the deck house. We're on the bridge of the Red Oak Victory, and I'm leaning on the binnacle for the magnetic compass. Now, whenever I have visitors, especially kids, on the ship, I ask them, which way does a compass point? And almost inevitably, they answer, north. Now, every once in a while, there's a smart kid in the group who says, magnetic north. And that kid is right. A, a magnetic compass points to a spot on the Earth referred to as magnetic north. Where is magnetic north? Well, it's somewhere north of here, but it's not the North Pole. And that's the important point, is there's a difference between true north, the North Pole, where the axis of the Earth, the theoretical axis of the Earth comes up out of the ground, and the magnetic north. There's a variation between those two points. Here in the Bay Area, that's about 16 degrees. Magnetic north is 16 degrees east of true north. But that's not consistent around the world. It changes depending on where you are on the globe. And this chart will show you what those changes are. This chart shows the variation between true north and magnetic north superimposed on a map of the world. For those who uh, are new to the concept of true north and magnetic north and, and compass variation. This chart's probably pretty surprising because it's so complicated. You would think that the compass variation would be a series of relatively straight and predictable lines all around the Earth. Well, obviously it turns out as we're looking at this chart that that is not the case. To interpret this chart, we can look first at the blue lines, and those lines in blue, like we see across the North Atlantic here, are those points where true north is east of magnetic north. So in other words, if I'm in the North Atlantic about where the pointer is showing right now, there's a 10 degree variation between true north and magnetic north. If I look at magnetic north on my compass, I have to look to the east 10 degrees for the direction of true north. If we move to the Pacific Ocean, we see uh, in most of the Pacific Ocean the opposite situation, where true north is to the west of magnetic north. And I think I mentioned just a few minutes ago that in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is approximately here on the map, the variation between true north and magnetic north is about 16 degrees. You have to be very cognizant, as you can tell from this chart, if you're using a magnetic compass to navigate over long distances because of these changes in uh, magnetic compass variation. So for example, in the old days of wooden sailing ships, it was pretty common to sail from England, from Portsmouth to the east coast of the United States. Well, if you look at Portsmouth, it's on this green line. And the green line indicates that there's no variation between true north and magnetic north. So you're starting out with a magnetic compass, which can be used directly uh, to look at your, your charts, which are all drawn, of course, with true north to the, to the top. As we move across the North Atlantic, the variation increases uh, to 10 degrees and 12 and 14 degrees as we're uh, approaching the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And so we're, we have to adjust our, uh, our course in order to compensate for that 
uh, change in the variation. And then as we get closer to the coast of the United States, the variation begins to go back down again to the point where uh, at landfall, let's say somewhere in North Carolina, uh, it might be back down to 10 degrees uh, variation again. So we have to we have obviously have to uh, understand that and take care of that. And this has been understood by mariners for hundreds of years. I have a reproduction chart in my collection of that shows the magnetic variation around the world. It's a chart that was drawn in the 1600s. Where I grew up in the Midwest, I was spoiled because I lived very close to one of these green lines where there is no variation between magnetic north and true north. And I learned land navigation. So I think in the area where I grew up at the time that I lived there, it was about uh, two degrees variation between true north and magnetic north. And for the short distances involved in land navigation, that's not even a significant difference. So we could virtually ignore that number. For long distance travel across the oceans, though, as this chart clearly points out, being aware of the difference between true north and magnetic north uh, is extremely important. Along came iron ships in the mid-1800s, and now there was another problem. A big chunk of iron, like a ship's hull, has a magnetic field of its own, and that magnetic field being very close to the compass is going to affect where the compass points. With the magnetic field that is created by the iron-hulled ship affecting the compass, a new style of binnacle had to be devised that had adjustments or compensations for the magnetic field of the ship. And that's the type of binnacle that we're looking at here on the bridge of the Red Oak Victory. The first thing that's apparent are these two quadrantal spheres. The spheres are made out of soft iron and they can be moved back and forth in a slotted um, uh, fitting here on either side of the, of, of the compass. Uh, and that will provide some adjustment, uh, some compensation for the magnetic field of the ship. In addition to that, behind the binnacle is what's called a flinders bar. The flinders bar is about a yard long and it consists of a series of soft iron segments and non-magnetic segments. And these can be adjusted in terms of length and position in order to further compensate for the magnetic field of the ship. Then inside the binnacle, there are three magnets. And one of those magnets is adjustable. It can be moved around, basically, to account for the fore and aft magnetic field of the ship. Another one of them is called the th a thwart ship's magnet. A thwart ship's means across the beam of the ship, and that can be used to adjust for the magnetic field that is uh, crosswise on the ship. And the third one is the healing magnet. And healing, in this case, means the ship is healing over in heavy seas, even that movement of the ship will cause a change in its magnetic field, which will affect the direction that the magnetic compass is pointing. So all three of those are used, all three of those magnets and the soft iron spheres and the flinders bar can be used to adjust and compensate for the magnetic field of the ship. And it's a pretty complicated process. It requires sailing a course and recording the uh, variation, uh, it's actually not called variation at that point. Variation refers to the, uh, to the difference between magnetic north and, and true north. What we're talking about is called deviation, and that is the difference between magnetic north and the north uh, that is, the compass is pointing at after being affected by the magnetic field of the ship.